So same concept is still there. You have, uh, as we did, as we multiplied H Hermitian at the MIMO, here we multiply H1 complex conjugate here, H2 complex conjugate right here, right? That's the solution that you see. And that, this basically uh, equations prove that W1 equal to H1 complex conjugate W2 equal to H2 complex conjugate, that is the optimum solution for this gain, and that maximizes the SNR right here at the output. Okay? Uh, in order to uh, understand it better, this is the visualization. Okay? This is the illustration in uh, the same one. So let's see. Here we have some constellation, okay? Constellation picture. When you have H1 and H2, you can plot that H1 and H2 in the constellation right here. This is imaginary axis, real axis, right? And let's say H1 is points here, and H2 is right here, okay? Just the example. H1 can be anywhere in, here, in this plot, but just a, as an example, let's say H1 is here, H2 is here, right? In that case, what is the H1 complex conjugate? H1 complex conjugate basically means that you flip it right here, right? You still have the same real value, but imaginary you flip it, flip the sign, right? That's complex conjugate. So complex conjugate is here, right here, which is H1 complex conjugate. And as we just looked at, W1 is going to be H1 Hermitian, uh, the complex conjugate. H2, W2, W2 is going to be H2 complex conjugate. So H W1 points here, W2 comes here, okay, based on that solution. Now what we do is that we are doing this calculation, right? You are multiplying W1 to Y1. W2 to Y2, and Y1, in fact, is the H1S plus N. So you put that together, then you eventually get this one. Okay? Once you do that, then let's say you multiply W1 to H1, then it, goes, it comes to purple. That's the receive, that's the SNR right here. That's the signal right here. Because you, your transmitter signal goes through the H1, right? And you multiply H1 uh, complex conjugate, that the output, after you multiply the gain, here at the output, is going to be purple. Same way, output here from the second branch, since you multiply H2 complex conjugate, output here is going to be something like green, OK? And you are adding those two together, right? So our output here is going to be addition of this guy and that guy. This guy is a purple in this picture. This guy is the yellow, uh, green in this picture. Here, the total output is now going to be the addition. Addition of a purple and green, which turns out to be yellow. Okay? So yellow is what you get here at the output. What we want is to maximize the SNR. In this case, maximizing SNR means what? You want to make largest arrow. Okay? That's the signal power, right? I want to get largest, largest length of arrow. That means maximize. So this is the only way. This is the best. This is the way that you want to maximize the size of the arrow. Okay? In this case, it just happened that it actually comes to uh, all of them, comes al actually aligned onto this real axis, but it doesn't have to be aligned on this way. You can actually, if you want, you can align it, align these three onto another direction. Doesn't matter. 
Okay? You can make the purple to go this way. And on the same uh, line, you can align this green one. You add it together. Again, the yellow will be on the same line, right? As long as the, all of them on, are on, the, on a line, on the same line, you still get the maximize, maximum SNR. So that's the intention of doing MRC. <clears throat> Second one is the equal gain combining. As you see here, this is an equal gain. Earlier in the MRC, let's go back to MRC. In MRC, it's not equal gain because here, the gain, this is gain, right? W1 is the gain for the first antenna. W2 is the gain for the second antenna. These two have a different gain, right? Because we do the W1 is H1 complex conjugate, H2 complex conjugate. So therefore, these two uh, do not have equal gain. As you see here, W2 is much longer, right? Much bigger than W1. W1 is, has a this much gain. W2 has this large gain. So these are not equal gain. On this equal gain combining system, the second system, what we do is that we are doing pretty much the same as MRC. In the sense that uh, W1 has a, has a, a minus theta 1 angle. W2 has a minus theta 2 angle. So it looks like complex conjugate, almost similar to MRC. The only difference is that W1 has unit size, okay? W2 also has a unit size. So this is not truly a H2 complex conjugate because H2 complex conjugate is somewhere here, right? You just flip it, then it should come here. It should be larger than that. But I want to make an equal gain, so these two are, have the, diff, say, the same size. So the, only the size is different compared to the MRC case. This one has a unit gain, <coughs> gain one, gain one, okay? But angle is still minus theta two, minus theta one. The angle, the angle should be always minus theta one, day two. That way, you multiply this one and this one, it actually comes to align into this line, right? In order, to make, in, order to, in order for this arrow to go this way, we have to have this omega one, has a minus theta one, omega two has to have a minus theta two. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So angle is important because what we want is to align purple, green, yellow, all on the same axis. That's what we want. You have to make it alignment. That way, in order to do that, we have to have an angle like this. But the gain is less important in that case uh, because the gain affects the size of the uh, arrow. So in this case, in, since you use the equal gain, uh, the size of the arrow is less than the previous case. So this is less optimal. The MRC is the optimal way. This is uh, the SNR in, in equal gain combining here is less than, it's worse than, a little bit worse than MRC. But this guy, the EGC, doesn't have to worry about the gain because it says simply equal gain. So we are no longer worried about the gain. So complexity-wise, a little bit simpler because we don't worry about the gain. Okay? Now let's think about third system, selection combining. This is what we looked at on the previous slides, right? In this case, uh, what we are trying to do is to select only one. We are not trying to use both of them. Uh, we are trying to select only one. So let me go back to my CEO example. Okay, let's go back to CEO example. Uh, EGC or MRC, right? These two system, I'm using both guys, right? So I'm CEO, first guy uh, has a higher performance, second guy's worse performance, Still, I give some amount of work to the second guy, right? So what I have to do? I have to give them salary, both of them, definitely, right? This, this guy is a worse performance, but still he's giving some work, right? So I have to give him some salary. Now, think about the selection combining. In this case, 
Uh, I'm CEO again. I have two guys working for me. The first guy is working uh, much better than the second guy. In that case, I'm, I'm giving all the work to only the first guy. Okay? Only this guy work. The second guy, he just do nothing. In that case, what I do? I'm not giving him salary, right? Because this guy does nothing. So there's some, some savings. In this case, of course, uh, I have less cost, right? Because this guy are not paid. This guy is not paid. This is just illustration, right? So that's kind of what's happening here. In, the, in this selection combining, I'm selecting only one. But when you choose one out of these two, you definitely want to choose a better one. But what's happening in this system is that at some point, this guy is better. Another time, this guy is better. Okay? That changes. So that's why I have to monitor which guy is better. I have to monitor continuously which guy is better okay, in continuous time. And, and this guy is better at some point, I choose this guy. If this guy is uh, uh, better at, at another time, I'll choose this guy. Okay? That's what's happening in the selection combining. So mathematically, it can be written this way, okay? And the, if I plot it same way, that's what's happening. Uh, this, each, each guy, each antenna, I still multiply the gain. For the first antenna, I multiply W1. Second antenna, I multiply W2. But when I choose the first antenna, I multiply W1 and I don't care about W2 because this second, second, if I choose the first antenna, I'm not using the second antenna anyway, so W2 doesn't matter, okay? So it is independent. But what is the best W1? Let's say I'm using only the first antenna. What would be the W1, the best W1? Again, that's going to be H1 Hermitian, H1 complex conjugate, right? Because H1 complex conjugate will cancel out the H1. Okay? So W1 is going to be H1 complex conjugate. Same way, W2 is going to be H1, H2 complex conjugate. That's what you see here. H, well, W1 is H1 complex conjugate. W2 is H2 complex conjugate. Okay? And once you do that, then as you see in this picture, uh, H1 and H1 complex conjugate will have a different angle, right? And then they combine, they multiply together, it's going to be the arrow on this real axis. Same thing happens. In fact, in this case, right, maybe you want to ask a question, why then, why you want to think about this one? Why not just use MRC? Because MRC actually performs much better. This selection combining is, has a worse performance. Reason is that, uh, there are two antennas, but I'm using only the one, right? I'm using best one, but still I'm using only one antenna. So performance-wise, uh, this one is worse than MRC. I'll show you the picture on the next slides, the performance. But the, this one, in fact, the, uh, performs, much, performs worse. Then the question is, why then we ever think about this system? The reason here is that since this system uses only one antenna at one point of time, you don't need multiple RF chain. What was the RF chain? RF devices, right? RF components. In the hardware, this case, you have only one RF component because at one point, only one antenna is activated. So for, if you use this antenna, then you use RF, one, RF component, one RF chain with this antenna. And later, if you choose a second antenna, then you use the one RF chain using second antenna, right? So it's uh, less hardware, because in this case, you only need one RF chain. So less cost, less hardware, less power consumption. That's the intention. Performance is worse than MRC. Another thing, the last one, is called the switched combining. This is another way to do it. Uh, in order to show you what's happening in the switch combining, here's a comparison. This picture shows you the selection combining, which we just looked at. So this one, at any point in time, I'm choosing the better one. Okay, that's what's happening here. 
In switched combining, that's not the case. In switched combining, uh, it's still like similar because there are two antennas, but I'm using only one antenna. In this case, I'm using only one antenna, same way. But when I choose one antenna, here's how to choose it. I have threshold, gamma t, okay? I have a certain threshold. What's happening is, as long as my receive signal is higher than gamma t, higher than threshold, I'm good. I'm not trying to find the maximum, okay? What I'm trying to do is that as long as the signal quality is better than this one, I'm happy. That's the intention, right? So now let's, let's see. I started from the blue one, and as time goes, blue one means that I, choose, I use the second antenna, right? And as time goes, it goes down and down, and now it goes fading, so therefore it actually goes even below the threshold, so it's time to switch. So let's switch to the green one. Suddenly jump, right? And I choose the green one. And then let's, let's come here. Um, let, let's here. Let's look at here. I'm using blue one here, and it crosses with the green. So at this point, green is better than blue. But I don't worry about that, because blue is still higher than my threshold. I'm happy with that anyway. I don't want to switch, OK? And then only when this blue goes below the this threshold, that's the time that I want to switch. So this one has a less number of switch, right? This one always I'm trying to find the better one. But in this case, as long as my signal is higher than this one, I'm happy that I don't want to switch. That's, the, that's what's happening in this switched combining. <clears throat> in switched combining, again, uh, since we are using only one antenna, we are selecting only one antenna, we can have only one RF chain. So less cost, less hardware, same way as in the previous selection combining. But how to operate, how to switch uh, one antenna to another, that's different from the previous one. OK, so far we looked at the receive diversity. And this picture shows you the transmit diversity. Uh, we can have multiple transmit antennas and single receive antennas. Why do we even think about this system? Okay, why? We can put the multiple antennas at the receiver, right? That actually performs much better. If you remember that what we talked about uh, early today, what was the problem of doing multiple antennas at the transmitter? What was the problem? Uh, CSI, right? Remember that? We have to somehow, in order to increase the performance, you have to send back the channel. So that's a big problem. But even with the back problem, why do we ever think about this transmit diversity? Receive diversity, multiple antennas at the receiver gives you very good performance. In fact, very good. What's the problem of that? Why we think about this one? Think about the practical system. Receiver is what? Your cell phone. Transmitter is? base station. Your cell phone receiver has a very small space, like this small, right? right? Your cell phone is small. So you can have only maybe two antennas. That's maximum. You cannot have like five antennas. But think about now the base station. Base station has a lot of power, a lot of budget, a lot of space, everything. So you can have as many antennas as you want, right? So typically, in practical system, we are interested in transmit diversity, right? Receiver, this is cell phone, you can make it very simple. That way, it reduces uh, power consumption. You can uh, have a longer life of battery, right? Simpler, the better in the receiver, typically. Transmitter, uh, you know, you can make a complex, no problem. So that's why we're interested in uh, transmit diversity, typically. Uh, but transmit diversity has some problem, right? So let's see. Uh, we can still think about four different systems, four different diversity combining systems, like what we see in the receive diversity. But out of these four, maximum ratio transmission, that's the same as the maximum ratio combining, MRC. This one still applies in the uh, transmit diversity, but all the other three are not much interested 
in this transmit diversity. You can still do it. You can still do th these three, no problem. But we are not much interested. Why? Because this first one, right, EGC, is a little bit low complexity version of MRC. Okay? It's a little bit low complexity than low com low complexity version of MRC. I'm not worrying about complexity. I have I have a lot of power budget. You know, I can use a power outlet. No, this is not battery operated, right? I have no problem on the complexity. I can use 10 micro, 100 microprocessors here. So this is let's use, okay? Less useful, so let's remove it. This one, selection combining and switch combining. Again, the benefit comes out of these two is that uh, you can use the hardware, less hardware, less cost, okay? Those are main advantage of these two systems. Still, I'm not interested because this one has a higher budget anyway. So therefore, these three are not really interested in the base station. We are only interested in pretty much MRT, in transmit diversity. So let's see what it is. Transmit diversity, if you look at the picture, it looks pretty much the same as MRC. The only difference is that if you change it, if you change the transmit receive, that's pretty much the picture, okay? So earlier in MRC, maximum ratio combining, you have a two receive antennas, right? And you have this picture at the receiver, right? You do the same thing at the transmitter. That's the only difference. All the other mathematics and all that are pretty much the same. And also even solution looks pretty much the same. H W1, the gain uh, for the first antenna is going to be H1 complex conjugate. This one is H2 complex conjugate. But what is the problem? The problem, again, the same problem still goes. The problem is that W1, the optimal omega 1, the optimal one is going to be H1 complex conjugate. But what is H1? H1 is a channel gain. So this guy has to know this H1. Again, we have a problem of CSI. Okay? CSI should be available at transmitter. That is the assumption, big assumption, big headache. Only if that is true, this whole thing is now valid and only then we can maximize the performance. Okay? So that's one big problem of uh, transmit diversity. But if that is possible, then we can still maximize it this way, same way. Maximize the same way as in MRC, receive diversity. If you visualize what's happening, then this is a plot. This plot is the same as MRC case. So let's uh, skip. Another popular transmit diversity, typically uh, these days, is uh, called the space-time block coding. Uh, right? There are a lot of other contexts, a lot of other papers on this or research outcomes about this space-time block coding. So this picture basically shows you some introduction about Alamuti coding, which is the basic uh, space-time coding. Okay? So it's better to know about this one. <laughs> if you go to IEEE Explorer, right? Uh, there's a way that you can find out which paper has been downloaded or has been referenced the most. Okay? Um, Alamuti, this is the name of the guy, right? Name of the guy. He was in, in Bell Lab, 1996 uh, or seven, late 1990s, right? And he wrote this paper, Alamuti's paper, uh, space-time block coding paper by himself, sole, sole author. Now, uh, he's, uh, he's a uh, chair of the research and development of Vodafone in UK. Okay, so he's alive. Yeah, he's not that old actually. Uh, one of my friend, uh, one of my coworker was a coworker with him at, th at that time. So I don't know him, but I have a, you know, indirect connection, kind of. So it looks like he's a very funny guy. Um, yeah, I heard that it's pretty cool. But the, uh, he doesn't have thousands of papers. I think he has only a few. Maybe this, only this one. I actually don't know. But this is, he, he wrote one paper, uh, but he's the, the most famous paper, most uh, downloaded paper out of this 
wireless communication research. So if you look at the IEEE Explorer, right, and find the which paper has been downloaded and referenced the most, this is the paper. Its paper has been referenced like more than 10,000 or several tens of thousands. Okay, it's been only 10 years, more than 10, a little bit more than 10 years, but that actually is the best one. So everyone, as long as you uh, study the wireless communication, everyone pretty much knows this guy name and knows this scheme. Okay, so this is the opportunity to learn this scheme if you are not aware of that yet. Uh, this is, this Alamuti coding is a, one of the space-time block coding. There are many other space-time block coding, but this is one of them, pretty much the most popular one. It starts from two transmit antennas and one receive antenna, very simple system, okay? Two transmit and one receive. As we looked at the previous system, like MRT, what you have done was that you multiply some gain for the first antenna, multiply another gain to the second antenna, right? And you transmit. So at this time, what happened is that you, over time, you make two different uh, transmit symbol and transmit, right? So each symbol is independent. You make uh, certain, you, you start from one symbol, right? And multiply two different gains in order to make a two different transmitted signal and transmit. And you go to the next symbol, again, you do the same thing. So each symbol, each transmitted symbol is independent. Whereas in space-time block coding, space means that you are using two different antenna, that's space. Time, this means that now we have a correlation between time. Each symbol is not independent anymore, okay? We make some correlation between time. So let's see how things work. We are starting from two different symbols, okay? It's, Every symbol is not independent. We are thinking about two different symbols, two consecutive symbols, okay? S1 and S2. S, S3 and S4 is also another code, and these two and the, the other two will be independent, okay? So we are only starting from the two symbols over time. Put these two symbols together and make this kind of matrix. And how to do that is called the encoding. So let's find out how the encoding works. T1 is the time for the first symbol. T1 plus 1 is the time for the second symbol. But you are not transmitting one symbol at T1 and next symbol at T1 plus 1. You are not doing it. You are put these two symbols in the buffer. Okay? You receive this one and inside here, you put that into the buffer and making these two, making this matrix, and then transmit in this way. So let's see. At time T1, through the antenna 1, you transmit S1. Through the, time, uh, through the antenna 2, you transmit S2, okay? But S1, S2 was the original symbol, right? Put those two into the buffer and transmit S1 and S2. On the next time symbol, you make minus S1 complex conjugate and S1 complex conjugate, okay? And then transmit on the second symbol time, okay? That's how you do in encoding. It's pretty simple, right? What you need to do is that you need to have a small buffer to contain to these two, these two symbols, right? You need a small buffer to do that. And then you do some small calculation of complex conjugate and then assign S1, S2, transmit. On the next time symbol, you switch it and then minus complex conjugate here, complex conjugate here. That's all you have to do at the transmitter. So very simple. Antenna one here, antenna two here, symbol time one, symbol time two. <clears throat> now, since we have a two transmit antenna, one receive antenna, we have a two different channel gain, H1 and H2. Since we thinking about two symbol time, we also have to think about two symbol time at the receiver, right? You are receiving Y1, and you are also receiving Y2, because you transmit it at two different time symbols, right? Symbol times you receive Y1 and Y2. And Y1, think about Y1. What is Y1? Y1 equals to S1 times H1 plus N, right? And, and plus, because you receive two of them, plus S2 times H2, right? 
So th th that's how things work. Y1 equal to H1S1 plus H2S2 because these two, S1 and S2, are the transmitted symbol at the symbol time 1, right? Plus N1. Y2 is the second symbol, second received symbol. And Y2 is, in case of Y2, minus S2 complex conjugate has been transmitted from here. S1 complex conjugate has been transmitted from here. So each one goes through H1, H2, that will be added together and it shows like this, right? So y1 equals to this, y2 equals to this, okay? If we rewrite into matrix notation, that's gonna be this one. These two and this matrix stay the same thing. We just write it as matrix, okay? This one and this one same thing. Now what we need to do is that since we have done encoding, at the receiver we have to do decoding. How to do the decoding is this way. Uh, we know H1 and H2 at the receiver, okay? So since we know H1 and H2, let's make a matrix like this. H1 complex conjugate H2, H2 complex conjugate minus H1. Let's make this matrix. And then you multiply this matrix into Y1 and Y2, okay? This is what we received and you, you make the y 2s complex conjugate like this, and you multiply this calculation at the receiver, okay? Because receiver knows H1, H2. You do that, you do this processing, then you get the R1 and R2, and let's find out what the R1 and R2 looks like after you do this. Then R1, you can actually do cal this calculation in mathematics. You can do this by hand, okay? You can, you can prove this. Y1 and Y2 looks like this, right? So for Y2, you do a complex conjugate for this one and put that in here and to solve this and, and, and multiply these matrices, then you get this one. So let's find out R1 and R2. Now R1, after you do this, R1 looks like this way. R2 looks like this way. What is important here was that earlier, earlier in I, Y1 has S1 and S2 all together. Y2 has S2, S1 all together, so because of there's interference, right? And after you do this decoding, what we find is that R1 equal to some gain, some channel gain, channel power times S1 plus noise. R2 equals to some channel gain times S2 plus noise. So R1 is only function of S1, R2 is only function of S2. Okay, that's what we see here. Okay, we can recover S1 and S2 perfectly, no problem. That's the main intention. And what is even more here is that, what, what is the biggest, biggest benefit? Exactly, that's the best thing. You don't need CSI at the transmitter. As I said earlier, knowing H at the transmitter is a big headache. It's a very, very big headache because we need a feedback channel. But in this case, right, what transmitter does is simply this, right? This is what the transmitter does. You don't need to, you didn't, you don't need to know the H at the transmitter. Receiver anyway knows H, so receiver does this processing, you can recover S1, S2 perfectly, and not just perfectly, if you look at the gain, channel gain, it's gonna be H1 square plus H2 square. This channel power is what you see at the MRC. MRC is the optimal system, right? So you can still see the optimal system. So simply speaking, with this space-time coding, you can achieve the maximum performance, optimal performance, without CSI at the transmitter. And it's pretty simple, right? It's very simple. That's why this is so popular. A lot of people, as I said, right, there are like tens of thousands of downloads or referenced, reference, referenced the paper. And a lot of people apply this one into OFDM system. A lot of people apply this one into Relay. They apply this, because this is so popular and so effective, they apply this one into many different systems, right? That's why they make so many papers, right? So you need to understand this one. And not only that, the fourth generation LTE, right? That's the, pretty much the standard 
for the near future, right? LT system has this alarm system, alarm T scheme in uh, built in in the standard, right? So this, this is not just theory. This is not the book. This is going to be practiced soon. It's already there, in fact, right? Because as you see here, this is so practical, right? So you need to understand. So finally, the outcome is going to be SNR can be written as this way. And this one is, in fact, the MRC, the SNR of MRC. So you, you know that uh, you can achieve the optimal performance out of this system. And compared to the previous system, what is different here is that you have space time. Okay? Earlier, no system is thinking about um, you know, putting these two consecutive symbols into the buffer and do the encoding mixing using space and time, space and time, right? And do this processing. So that's the time, that's pretty much the first one that people were thinking about space time, right? And you are mixing the symbols over space, over time, right? And do encoding and also decoding. And after this, right, a lot of space-time block coding has appeared uh, and more generalized form and things like that. But still, this is the most popular because it's very simple. Okay. Uh, okay, let, let's briefly look at the uh, bidder probability. Uh, we can start from the basic. Basic thing is the single antenna system using BPSK, right? This is a picture of BPSK. You can either uh, transmit minus, minus energy, positive energy. This is like antipodal signal. Then you transmit over a single antenna case, right? Then we know that the bit error rate, in this case, if we assume a AWGN channel, okay, only the noise. So H is now 1, okay? No H. In that case, since H is 1, we say Y equal to S plus N. That's the simple model with H equal to 1. In that case, we call that as AWGN channel because there's only noise. The, S, the B data rate in case of AWGN is going to be Q function. We know that, right? This Q function. That's the uh, B data rate of BPSK in case of AWGN. Now, uh, if we want to find out the beta rate with a fading channel, now we can introduce H. It's no longer one, but we have H, like this, right? And H typically follows a Rayleigh fading. So if we assume that way, then we can find out the BER in this way, right? Do the integration. This Q function is the beta rate in case of AWGN, but now we have fading. So this F of R is a fading PDF. So you multiply these two and do an integration. That's going to be a BR equation in case of fading. Right? Yeah, so uh, let's move on. If we plot these two, then this is a picture. You, you see that this waterfall curve, right? This waterfall curve is the BER in case of AWGN, as you see here. And this blue one is the case of Rayleigh fading. So as you see here, typically, better BER means you, your BER curve goes this way, right? Goes this way is a means better BER. But as you see here, the blue curve goes very, very slowly. So compared to AWGN, when you have a Rayleigh fading, the performance is much, much worse. Much, much worse, right? The right way to see this kind of picture is that, let's say I want to achieve the bit error rate of 10 to the minus 2. This one, right? This is my uh, target BER. In that case, if the channel was just the AWGN, I need only uh, minus 4 dB okay, of SNR. But if we have a fading, Rayleigh channel fading, that basically means that I need instead 14 dB of SNR, okay? So AWGN channel and 
failing channel, that's definitely very different in terms of SNR. We need much, much higher SNR in the fading. Right? That's what you see in this picture. <clears throat> now let's see what happens when you have a multiple antennas. Same, we use the same BPSK. We have two different antennas at the receiver. Then uh, again, in the same way, we can formulate the BR equation this way. But now, uh, this looks very similar. But look at this PDF of R. What is this one? That's the PDF of output SNR. Why do I say output SNR? Because I want to, I'm interested in SNR here, not here, okay? Here at the output. That's why I'm saying output SNR right here. But remember, when you have MRC, right? Then you multiply some gain here, multiply another gain here, and you add it together, right? That's the output here. So the output SNR right here is typically higher than the SNR here, right? So definitely this F of R is, is different, different than Rayleigh. Each one is Rayleigh because our channel is Rayleigh, but when you add it all together, statistics that here is not Rayleigh. So F of R is not Rayleigh. F of gamma is not Rayleigh anymore. Okay, remember that. This is not really anymore. This is some other PDF. Okay, use those PDF and using the same integration technique to find the BER, then you'll find the BER in case of MRC. If you use a selection combining here, right, which means that you choose only the best one, definitely you get the different PDF. That PDF should go here, then you'll get the BER when you have a selection combining, okay? So this is a very generic, general way to find out the BER. Only difference is this one, F of R, okay? If you use MRC, you get the different FR, F, the PDF, you get selection combining, you get different PDF, okay? So this is only different. So now this picture shows you the actual BER. So here the red one, is the, MR, is the case when MRC is used. And that's the EGC, this is the selection combining or selection diversity. So you see that the MRC is the best. EGC is a little bit worse. And SD selection is a little bit even worse, okay? So MRC is always uh, the optimal. So whenever you compare the BER, you should use MRC as your reference because MRC always is the best one was optimal, okay? So you are gonna use MRC uh, to be a reference. Okay, here, this picture, this, uh, I have uh, three more slides. This slide basically shows you some of the basic concept. Okay, as I said, uh, this is the general way to find out BER, and what I, what I want is, I want to rephrase this Q function using some approximation. This is one approximation in case of high SNR. So if you look at the Q function, right, that can be, Q function looks like this, right? And if you think about high SNR, then that can be approximated by exponential. So you can use this approximation, then replace this Q function with the exponential like this. Then now, since this is exponential, using this Rayleigh fading, I can, Rayleigh fading is again exponential, right? So you can combine this together, now integration is gonna be very simple. That's why we use this approximation. Right, this is Rayleigh, so you put this together here. This is exponential, again exponential, put this together, and then do a simple integration, finally you get this one. Look at this one, this is the BR, right? This is a function of SNR, of course. From here, I'm gonna apply one more approximation. That approximation is gonna be, this SNR is much, much higher than one. Here's one plus something, right? So if, if this is a big, then one can be ignored. So I, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna ignore that. If you ignore that, then you flip it, then you can rewrite this way, okay? Little bit of approximation, but still you can rewrite this one into this way. Now if you uh, change this whole thing into this way, what we can find out here is that, what is this one? This one is SNR, right? I'm talking about PR, right? BR equals to 
SNR inverse times some D. What is D? D is the symbol distance. Okay? D over 4 to the inverse. Okay? From this picture, what we can see is that this power exponent of SNR, okay? that's called the diversity order. That's what I mean by diversity gain. Okay? Diversity gain comes from this diversity order. And the additional term right here, this is typically called the coding gain. Okay, then uh, we need to briefly talk about what is a coding gain. Coding gain comes from encoding, decoding. Uh, we didn't talk about anything about that, but you have a channel coding, right? You've probably heard about the uh, convolutional coding or turbo coding. Why do we do that kind of coding? Because we want to transmit our symbol or our bits more reliable over this channel. So we are doing encoding, okay, before transmit, and go to transmit over to the channel and the receiver, you are doing decoding. So this encoding and decoding will give you some gain, okay? This coding will make your symbol to be reliable. So once you do the encoding, definitely the BER will be less, right? That's why we are doing that, right? So that will be represented in here. If you have a higher coding gain, very stronger protection, you have higher gain here, okay? If you use uh, less, if you use another coding with a less gain, you'll have a small value here. That that's what you can see from the VR. Here, this part, right, power exponent, that's going to be diversity order. Now I have a minus 1. Why I have a minus 1? Because I'm, I'm basically simply assuming a single antenna case. This is the PDF of Rayleigh, meaning that I use only one antenna. As I said, as I just said in the previous slide, if I use a two antennas, right, and I use a MRC, then this f of gamma is no longer Rayleigh. Remember that I just said that, right? Go back to here. If we use MRC right here, then each one is going through the Rayleigh, this one Rayleigh, this one Rayleigh, but once we add it together, here it's no longer Rayleigh. This f of gamma is not Rayleigh. You get some, some other things. But in this case, I use this just Rayleigh, so I'm using single antenna. If you use the MRC with the two antennas, right, then you get something different. So put that in here, and you do the same thing, then you will get minus two right here, minus two. Because you use two antennas, you have a two diversity order. Here you see minus two, okay? So from this PR, what you can see is that this will contribute as a diversity order and now let's see, this is a, if this is minus 2, what does that mean? If this is minus 2, right, this is a power exponent, right? That basically means that when you have a higher value in the power exponent, minus 2, then compared to the case of minus 1, with the same SNR, it goes much faster, right? So look at this picture. This is a BR. This blue one is the case of uh, minus one, diversity order one. This means diversity order one, okay? Minus is not part of the diversity order. This is the diversity order of two. This is the diversity order of four, okay? This is the actual BR, green one, blue one, uh, red one, okay? So if you see this picture, then you see that this is the case of diversity order one. This is the case of diversity order two, two antennas. This is the case of diversity order four, four antenna at the receiver. So you see that now the curve looks like more sharp, okay? Which means that it's much better, okay? You get much better BR performance. So that's the benefit of diversity. Why we wanna use diversity? This is the reason, okay? Your bit error rate is, is decreasing much, much faster rate with the higher diversity order. You put the more antennas at the receiver, that means your PER is decreasing much faster. That's the reason, okay? And that's what you can see in this picture. Uh, we talked about also the coding gain, right? Here, the, this part, the second part is coding gain. That's this picture. Let's say 
I, my diversity order is just one, okay? That's this one, right? But if I use a higher, uh, if I use another code with a higher coding gain, that means that this BR graph is now moving to left. It doesn't change the shape, okay? Changing the shape is a diversity order. As I said earlier, if you change the diversity order from one to two, now this slope changes. But if you increase the coding gain, slope is the same. It actually moves parallel, right? In parallel, it moves to the left if you use a higher coding gain, okay? So from the, this blue to that blue, you use a higher coding gain. From this red to that red, these red one are the case of diversity over two. And you, if you use a higher protection, it, this one moves to left. Okay? So now you understand that the BR is affected by diversity order. BR is also affected by coding gain, but different way. Diversity order, you change the slope. Coding gain, you moves to the left. Okay? Typically, we use both, of course, right? Uh, in every wireless system, we use both of them together. Uh, I guess that's, uh, that's it for today. Any question? Okay, then uh, see you next week. <laughs>